Hello and welcome to the Daily Mule for Friday the 17th of November 2023. Just from yesterday, I made a video covering two days and I'm back already because uh, there's quite a few uh, stories to talk about uh, on, uh, today on Friday. Um, we're going to start off with this. Um, yet again, this guy can't stop talking. Uh, Joe Edwards, uh, motor mouth. Um, he just keeps talking and talking very slowly uh, this is an exclusive interview so it's an exclusive talk uh, with Millwall head coach Joe Edwards on playing one game as a Lions junior the magic of Mourinho and learning coaching fundamentals this is from londonnewsonline.co.uk the South London Press's online website Joe Edwards enjoyed a dream start as Mill head coach last weekend, but it was not the first time that he had represented the club. The 37-year-old, who was raised in New Morden and schooled in Surbiton, uh, joined Chelsea's academy at the age of 16. But Edwards told the South London Press this week that he had one match as a junior for the Lions. Uh, Me and my dad were talking about it the other day, said the Mill boss, who watched his new team thump Sheffield Wednesday 4-0 on Saturday. Uh, when kids are 8 or 9, they do the rounds and they play for everyone. Uh, I played for Millwall as a right winger against Tottenham and I, I probably would have been like 8 years old. Um, I think I scored a few goals, which was quite unusual for me. I ended up joining Chelsea. Uh, we'll blame it on the geography that I ended up going there. The club's base is in Cobham. Uh, Edwards shifted to uh, holding midfield a while on the Blues books before being released at 16. His next move was to AFC Wimbledon. Oh, physically, I was an incredibly late developer, said Edwards, who has a short stint as England under-20 head coach before succeeding Gary Rowe at the uh, den. I probably had the physique of like a 13-year-old when I stepped up to the under-18s for a few days, uh, games, uh, like you do in the under-16 age group when they are making decisions about you. I was facing lads with big quads, facial hair, and really starting to develop. It was a struggle for me. I had a difficult period around 16. I wasn't developing and affecting the game. It was 17, 18 and 19 when I developed athletically. And it cost me my place at Chelsea. It was absolutely the right decision. Uh, I had some issues with my knees, which weren't career-threatening. I joined AFC Wimbledon during the club's very early stages. I can't remember now what division they were in, but it was lower league stuff. I was probably spoilt with how good football looked and felt for me as a young kid, although uh, Chelsea's academy kicked on even more once the Roman run. Bramovich Reen uh, went into full flow and the investment came in. Uh, it was still a great academy before that. Uh, the coaching I was receiving and the players I was uh, playing with were way ahead of my friends at school. I found the drop without sounding disrespect or t tough to take. I had that transfer from playing at academy football with some top players, England internationals, of football with a very certain style to that level. I struggled to affect uh, the games and that meant I wasn't enjoying it very much. Uh, the big thing was that uh, the passion, motivation and enjoyment had gone. Uh, Chelsea have always been brilliant with looking after their own once they've gone out the door. I think they knew I was in a difficult place, that I was playing football for very little money and that I didn't know where my career was going to head if it wasn't to be football. Uh, Edwards is, was invited to help out at the Chelsea Development Centre nearest to his home. Oh, I was bright and enthusiastic. I always had a good attitude as a kid, he said. Uh, I would have been one of those young players who the staff enjoyed working with and wanted to help because I gave it my all. Uh, it was a chance to get some pocket money and be around here. Yeah, I very quickly developed a passion for it and it spiralled and progressed from there. For probably 18 months to a couple of years, I was balancing the two. I was doing my coaching at Chelsea and still playing, travelling to evening games and that. Uh, but then I started getting involved, uh, getting invited to help out with the training sessions for the older age groups. Uh, not only doing my stuff with the under sevens and under eights, uh, Paul Clement was the under sixteen coach, and Brendan Rogers was the, with the under eighteens. Uh, more and more people were asking me to assist with, with sessions. Looking back at it, it probably meant just serving the balls uh, in and being around it. Uh, I wasn't coaching the under sixteens as a real rookie coach myself, but there started to be more and more clashes. It was either playing a Tuesday night game in the middle of nowhere. Or stay around Chelsea's academy, which was a setup which was really professional, and there was a great energy there. I found it quite an easy decision to pursue my coaching career. Uh, Jose Mourinho had just become the manager, and the team was on the up. You could see where the club was going. It was a club that was home to me anyway. I knew there was a real opportunity there, but that I had to give it absolutely everything. I couldn't be that guy who was constantly saying, "I can't do this and I can't do that," because I got this game. 
I wouldn't say that at a young age I clearly had the aspiration to one day be a manager, but as a 19 or 20 year old coach, I was out regularly alongside the first team training pitches watching Jose Mourinho in his first couple of sessions there, and that was impressive and it did inspire me. Chelsea secured their first top flight title in 50 years in the 2004-2005 season and successfully defended a crown under the pool legend. Mourinho also won one FA Cup and two League Cups in his first spell with the West Londoners. Uh, it sounds weird to speak so glowingly of this now because the organisation of his sessions is so normal now, said Edwards recalling Mourinho's methodology. There would be two pitches side by side and nearly every section of the pitch would have different exercise set out. It would be set out before the session started and once you saw it in full flow they would seamlessly go from one to the next to the next and they were connected somehow and had relevance to the style of play. If you came and watched our sessions I'd like to think you'd see that now but that was nearly 20 years ago, it wasn't the norm. He had the real attention uh, to detail and charisma, he had the voice that just bellowed across both pitches. He kind of spoke in bullet points. It was so clear that this was what uh, we're trying to do. The intensity of the sessions, watching it in my early days of coaching, were real wow moments. Edwards managed Chelsea's under-18s and won two FA Youth Cups, as well as steering their under-23 side to the EFL Trophy semi-finals. He had spent 27 years with the Blues when he opted to be, uh, be reunited with Frank Lampard at Evan, joining as his number two. Prior to that, he had been assistant coach to Lampard and Thomas Tuchel at Chelsea. Our work in at Chelsea's academy in particular felt like a school for the players and a university for the coaches, said Edwards. It wasn't just come in and do your job, take training, take the games, coach the kids and go home. Uh, we were always being pushed. Uh, what are your next badges you can get on? Or we were arranging coaching days where we were getting external people to put on a session for us to watch. One of our people in the academy would go to listen to a guest speaker or visit another club, but if uh, you did that and you had to come back to present and show it all to us. There was this constant flow of learning. Once you step up and work at first team level, it's not as easy to maintain that once you're in the Amster's wheel. It's so relentless and then it's a results driven business. I spent so many years where we were getting pushed uh, but also helped to keep getting better and better. In terms of the trophy success, we had a relentless run in the FA Youth Cup and the UEFA Youth, uh, Youth League. We were very conscious from a coaching point of view that we were given the best facilities and we were incredibly well resourced, especially in terms of players. We were very aware we didn't want to produce spoiled kids. As much as people could talk about the level of the play we had, uh, technically, tactically and athletically, mentality was a huge thing for us. We were almost self-conscious of it that we were the club that had all the money, gave the kids everything and produced those spoiled prima donnas. And what you got was the opposite. You got boys who could play. We played some attractive football, but we could run, fight, and compete. We managed to blend the two. We won the uh, the Youth Cup six out of eight years, something like that, which was quite unusual. Uh, in my days as a player and early days as a coach, there would be upsets all the time. I remember seeing our youth team go out against teams like Brighton when they were a lower level team in Colchester. It was a common thing, like the senior FA Cup. If you didn't turn up, you'd get kicked out because the opposition would get into you. But it's a big part of my coaching now. I do like a certain style of football. But there's no point talking about any of that if you're not going to do the basics and run. Exactly, exactly. Um, so there you go. We also have, again, like I said, he loves to talk, doesn't he? Here we go again. Joe Edwards, again, talking to the Suffolk News.co.uk. <coughs> uh, Joe Edwards explains what diligent and loyal assistant head coach Andy Myers will bring to Millwall. Uh, Myers left Chelsea to work at the Den and there's a long working relationship going back years with the new Lions head coach. Uh, Joe Edwards is hopeful the diligent and loyal assistant head coach can help uh, Mill push on this season. Andy Myers was hired alongside the 37 year old last week with the uh, pair sharing a professional relationship for well over a decade. Like Edwards, Myers 50, he's 50 years old that gives it a the bald one in the middle. Damn, he doesn't look it does he? 50. Spent much of his coaching career guiding Chelsea's youth players and was lone player technical coach at Stamford Bridge before agreeing to join the Lions. <coughs> Pardon me. Edwards told the news that then, Andy and I probably first worked together maybe around maybe 2009. I was the under 15s coach at Chelsea and he assisted me there. Uh, we then w went to work together as a coaching team at various different levels across the academy at Chelsea. And he's been a head coach himself. He was the under-23s head coach at Chelsea when they won the Premier League 2 in 2020. He did a stint away where he was an assistant coach at Vitesse Arnhem in Holland. 
when they won the Dutch Cup the, the year he was there. I think that was the first trophy they'd won in around 30 years. Uh, so Handy has a, a vast amount of experience as a coach. Of course, he was a player, played in the Premier League for Chelsea and then various teams in the Football League. So Andy also has that long playing career at a high level that I don't really bring to the table. We're incredibly close off the pitch. He's one of the most loyal people you can meet and I think the players will find him like that as well. He's very diligent about organising his work, but if the players ever need him or any advice or support, it will be fantastic for the players in that sense, as well as myself. So there you go. Now, we move on. Is this also Joe Edwards? No. SuffolkNews.co.uk, that man there, do you remember him? Do you remember him? It feels like it's been ages, isn't it? It's, it's been like, what, a month? Uh, it was all done very professionally and honourably. How Gary Rout left me all last month. So here come the details. Dishing out the gossip. Steve Kavanagh said the situation was not easy, but praised all parties for how it was handled. Uh, Steve Kavanagh insists the parting of ways with Gary Rowett was done professionally and honourably. The 49-year-old coach left the Denby Mutual Consent almost exactly a month ago, opening the door for Joe Edwards to become the new head coach. Uh, Rowett had been in charge for almost four years and established Mill as a top half championship side who were consistently fighting for a place in the playoffs. Speaking last week, Mill Chief Executive Kavanagh told News at Den, I was all done very professionally and honourably in a very open manner. Uh, everyone uh, operated fairly and reasonably. Any negotiation is always difficult, and someone saying they feel the time is up is never easy. But we all worked together and came to the outcome that was fair and balanced. It's never a good period. It creates instability. I got the call from Gary and his agent saying, we'd like to have a, diff a, a diff different conversation, a difficult conversation. I think that difficult. And I think actually from there to appointing Joe, you understand all the work that goes on behind the scenes uh, because we weren't having conversations. We hadn't been out in the market. It, was, it wasn't something we were actively trying to change. So in that short period, we've gotten to somewhere, and now we can move forward. I want the fans to get behind Joe and his team. There's some good people there, and the den needs to be uh, what it has always been. It needs to be a fierce, competitive environment, which is positive for our team, and that creates a difficult atmosphere for the opposition. Uh, Gary's done a great job in really establishing us as a championship club and moving us forward to compete for the playoffs year in, year out. That pl platform then allows you to continue to grow. So there you go. Uh, the den needs to be what it has always been. It needs to be a fierce competitive environment which is positive for our team. That creates a difficult atmosphere for the opposition. So it was the home form. The home form. Um, the bad, bad, bad home home form. Seems that what done it. That's what done it. Now, moving on to this. Was put out by Millwall earlier today. Mills George Savile to captain Northern Ireland. Not bad. George Savile will celebrate his 50th Northern Ireland cap by captain inside against Finland. Uh, the Green and White Army played a penultimate Euro 2024 qualifier in Helsinki on Friday, kickoff at 5 pm. That was today. I'll let you know how he got on. Um, spoiler alert, he wasn't very good. Uh, with the midfielder handed armband by Michael O'Neill for his milestone appearance. Um, so, yeah. So here you go, there's the tweet. On what will be his 50th cap, George Savile will captain Northern Ireland tomorrow against Finland in Helsinki. There he is there in the press conference with the man. It doesn't look so happy. Doesn't he look so happy. Suomen Balolito. Bless you. Um, so. So you can see they can't qualify. Um, they're not doing very well. And they give the armband to a player because he's getting his 50th cap. So um, there you go. Now, this is how it went for them. Um, they lost 4-0. It was 1-0 at half-time. It ended up being 4-0. They were away to Finland. It's going to be freezing out now, I imagine, at this time of the year. Um, that's... Uh, when you come to do the fixtures, this is probably not the fixture you want to Finland away in November, but here we go. Um, so, how did George Savile play on his 50th cap as a captain? Well, he got he's, he was their ninth highest rated player. 5.98. Uh, 
Um, he had two shots, both of which weren't on target. He had a passing accuracy of 87. He had 62 touches, which was actually the most on any Northern Ireland player. Uh, if we look to see if we can see anything else, if it loads. Um, okay, defensively, did, did he do a bit of hard work in defence? He had one tackle, two clearances, which is quite high. And that was it. Passing wise, where are we at? Here. So 46 passes, which again is up there. So he had the most touches and the most passes of the ball, it looked like. Second most. 87% accuracy, two crosses, zero accurate. Three long balls, three accurate. So there you go. Um, bit of a game to forget for Northern Ireland. Um, so there you go, 50 caps for Northern Ireland, not bad, not bad, not bad. Um, fair play to him for sticking at it, even though they're not very good. Um, talking of Jules Savile, probably to coincide with that, I don't know, but uh, this is a weird one. This is a weird one. So this is LondonNewsOnline.co.uk, South London Press's online website. I would love to stay longer. Jules Savile keen on Mill stay and rates goal at Hillsborough as one of the best in his career. Jules Savile admitted he would jump at the chance to extend his Mill contract. Aha! Uh -huh. Is are we reading between the lines and trying to figure out why he was dropped by Gary Rowett? Um, either Gary Rowett was trying to get him to sign a contract. I don't know if the extension is automatic and. It's at a certain rate automatically. Or what's going on? Um, was he trying to get him out of the club? Was he trying to get him to leave? Don't know. But this could be very interesting. Uh, the 30 year old midfielder produced a superb 25 yard finish in last weekend's 4 0 win at Sheffield Wednesday. As New Lions head coach Joe Edwards kicked off his reign with a thumping result. <laughs> Savile has made 166 appearances for the South London Club. Asked about his future by the South London Press, the Northern Ireland International said, oh, I've got this year left. Uh, there, there is a clause for potentially one more, an option year. At the moment, it is just this season. Of course, I'd love to stay. I appreciate the fans as well. They show me a lot of love. Savile marks his goals with glasses celebrations, which are for his three-year-old daughter, Winnie. My little girl is visually impaired, he said. It's the biggest thing in my life. It comes to mind straight away. I think that's what I'll be doing from now on. Savile scored two goals for Mill, both left-footed and in away wins. He got the clincher in the 2-0 victory at Plymouth and then struck the outside of his foot against the Owls. My professional goal when I was at Brentford is probably the best uh, I've scored, uh, but Saturdays is uh, up there, said Savile. Uh, without sounding arrogant, the Plymouth one was quite easy. The defender was in line with the post and I used him to guide it around him. Whereas this one, I actually had to put my foot through it. Obviously, it was a really good, enjoyable day. I don't remember the last time we won 4-0 or we even scored four goals. It was great for the new gaffer to get a win, good confidence boost for the lads. And a brilliant day for the fans. Uh, it just felt like everything went for us, you know. Uh, you get some days like that in football, but not often. So you've got to enjoy them when it all does click and get into place for you. Edwards had three sessions with his new squad before the fixture at Hillsborough. There were a few pointers that he came to in training with, uh, with and we executed quite well, said Savile. There was a defensive setup, and he wanted to work on 4-4-2 off the ball, which was nice and, and compact. And there was a little bit on the distances between us all. We wanted to make them smaller on and off the ball. Uh, when we are in good areas, it means we have options. And when we're defending them, we're defending in numbers and able to, to impact the ball. He wants the distances between the centre forward and the centre backs to be as short as they can. So that's uh, so that when we're attacking or defending, we're all doing it together as a team. Uh, we brought that to the team and the shape was good. Uh, Joe's style means uh, he's uh, he's hoping for us to score more goals and maybe focus on us a little bit more. I've scored goals in my career, it's not something I'm sure of. Edward's predecessor, Gary Rowett, left last month, just stays shy of four years as a mill boss. He did a fantastic job for, me, for the football club, said Savile. One thing I would say is that he put the football club in a position where the men above, uh, the suits above, were put in a position where they can make a decision where they wanted the club to go. And they weren't forced to make a decision because of the position we were left. 
in or anything like that. It was a question of where they wanted to take the club next, and full respect to Gary for what he did and where he took the club. Uh, now it's down to us as players and management and the people above to take that club to the next step up. So there you go, George Savile there. George Savile. Very interesting, very interesting. Why was he dropped? Does he know? Don't know. Is it to do with his contract? We know, we we now know that there was funny business with Vogel Sammer's contract last season. Why, like, why is his, why was this guy starting? Oh, he's got a clause in his contract. If he starts a certain number of games, then it automatically triggers an extension in his contract. So is that the thing with George Savile? And I think it's the same with Alan Campbell. Are we trying to? Do we need to play him a certain amount of times, or Luton can recall him in in January? But again, with George Savile, does he have, is it does his option automatically kick in? And the people at the at the top of the club were saying, "Yeah, don't play him because we don't want to. We don't want his contract to to automatically extend." Is that what's going on? Like that was very weird. That one of our best players from last season was just turfed out of the team for no reason. Um, just bizarre. Anyway, uh, I'm not sure it will all resolve itself in time. Um, secret secrets are no fun. Secret secrets hurt someone. Uh, moving on to this. Talking of international players, Northern Ireland, here are the other lot. Republic of Ireland, under 21s no less. Why am I showing you this? Well, if you didn't know, Hidomi Umaka played for them. He played for them. He's not in the picture there. I don't think. Is that him? That's not him at 22, is it? It might be, but he looks absolutely freezing. Um, is it him? Uh, I don't know. He looks all puffed up in his face. Um, yeah. Like, similar to the, to the uh, Northern Irish team playing uh, in a freezing cold uh, environment. Um, they played in Norway and they were doing all right. Domi and Maku scored, uh, but then once he went off as a sub, once he got subbed off, it all went uh, to pot. Um, so here we go. So Norway under 21s three, Republic of Ireland under 21s two. Imaku scored on the 37th minute, so he scored the equalising goal. It was Norway scored first? Maku equalised it. Northern Ireland went in front just after the second half started in the 53rd minute. Then Amaku went off as uh, went off in the 62nd minute. Ten um, ten minutes after that, penalty, and then five minutes after that, another goal. It's three two. So the Republic of Ireland. Uh, this is from the Irish Times dot com, by the way. For all your Irish news needs, uh, the Republic of Ireland under 21's winning start to Euro 25 qualifying. It's over, and they let three points slip in their final 20 minutes of a freezing night in Drammen. They were undone by two late Norwegian goals, which saw them drop to third in Group A behind Norway on goal difference, and one point off the leaders, Italia, who they meet on at Turner's Cross on Tuesday. So they got to play uh, Italy in Ireland uh, this Tuesday, next week. Uh, the all Klondalkin strike partnership Whatever that means, I don't know what that means. This is a, I don't know. Of Edomu Maku and Sinclair Armstrong had seen Jim Crawford's side overcome a deficit to lead in sub zero temperatures. Uh, the early substitution of the man of the match, Maku, man of the match, proved costly, however, as Norway kept the call ahead, dispatching a penalty before 77 minute winner from backup striker Lasse Nordas. Uh, Crawford made five changes from the 2-1 victory over Latvia last month, with skipper Joe Hodge recovering from shoulder surgery and vice-captain Andy Moran uh, competing for a senior debut, and Selmo Garcia McNutty uh, was handed the armband on his return from injury. Imaku was given his first start up front. First start, man in the match, scores a goal. Hey, hey, hey. And the middle marksman was a bundle of energy from the off. He led the Irish press to stress test the Norwegian defence and won back possession time and a gain. He turned over the ball to tee up Armstrong in the third minute, but his pile driver was parried over by Sander Tugvik. It was a game of few early chances, both on Lowell and Conor Reardon dealt comfortably with the false nine role Manchester United prospect Isaac Hansen or Rowan. Uh, a set piece would prove their undoing, though, as Norway scored with their first real opportunity 
in the 20th minute. After his corner was initially repelled, uh, Christian Arnstadt was given too much time to deliver the ball, uh, the second ball under the head of Alvor Rodolion Opsval, who sent it in looping over Josh Keeley in goal. Imaku directed the Irish response. He forced Tangvik into a strong save, and in the 37th minute, he had the goal he's play deserved. He harassed Celtic's €3 million Euros, uh, midfielder Odin Thiago Holm into a mistake. And when Armstrong's shot was blocked, it fell perfectly for his fellow Klondalkin native to sweep into the bottom corner. Oh, so Klondalkin is like an area, is it? Uh, Imaku smashed the crossbar on the half volley, although it was called back for offside, before his telepathic understanding of Armstrong gave Ireland the lead in the 53rd minute. Uh, the QPR target man won the flick on from Garcia Magnati's uh, long ball, and Imaku knew what to do, playing it straight back into Armstrong's path. So a little one through there. So he got an assist as well. He showed why he's been given his senior debut by Stephen Kenny, with his first time finishing making it look so easy. He's talking about uh, Armstrong there. So Armstrong played for the Ireland's first team. Uh, Imaku's replacement, Johnny Kenny, almost made it free after some quick thinking from Matt Ely. Uh, Tangvik's trailing leg just took it to the wrong side of the post. Uh, that would prove costly when the Austrian referee, Volpa Hartmann, uh, penalised Healy for a pull on Leeds United's Leo Haldi at a corner. Arnstad uh, dispatched a power pack penalty beyond Keeley's reach. Uh, Ireland fell behind four minutes later. Joel uh, uh, Mugisha spun past Lower and backup striker Nordus produced a brilliant finish off the underside of the crossbar. Uh, they piled on the pressure in search of an equaliser, but Garcia McNulty's a stoppage time header was cleared away from danger by Hopsval. Um, and as you can see, so first start for Imaku. Scores a goal, gets an assist, man in a match. When he came off in the 62nd minute, the, the rest of the team crumbled away. Um, so there you go. Um, wow. Shame I can't see it anywhere. But there might be highlights somewhere, I don't know. The, fuck, the trouble is, when you go on YouTube and try and search for stuff, there's so much junk on there of people trying to clickbait you into watching like a live game and it's just some twat on Football Manager or it's like a text service thing. So, bro, just, can you just give me the highlights, YouTube? You know what everyone wants to watch. You know, you've got, you've got computers and algorithms. Can you not figure this shit out? Stop with this. Stop with this shit. But yeah. So maybe we might be able to see um, the highlights of that somewhere. Um, I'll try and find them for you and pass them on. Um, is that is that a Damir Maku? He does wear 22, doesn't he? It doesn't. I mean, he looks like he's so fucking cold. It might be him, actually. It might be him. He's, Jesus Christ. Damn, bro. He's so cold. It, it doesn't look like it's him. Now, you may be wondering... You might be, you might not be. How much money do they raise at Poppy Day in a den? Doesn't really. Happen. Why haven't they told us yet? Well, the reason why they haven't told you yet is because it's still ongoing. Um, the, the shirts that they wore against Southampton, uh, the shirt, the match shirts, and the warm-up T-shirts are still on auction, and they can't give you a total figure of how much money they've raised until this has. Been done and dusted, and as you can see, that you can there's still some bargains to be had. Um, this runs out um, Sunday, the nineteenth. I think it's around about two p.m. I'm not too sure. It does say one day left. Um, but look, Alan Campbell, you can get your shirt for hundred and twenty-two quid. Why not? Um, where are we going? Bradshaw, Romain Essay, 319. Uh, 341 for Cooper. Why has he got a long sleeve shirt though? I don't understand. I thought that they all had to wear the same shirts. And if you wanted a long sleeve, you had to have an undershirt. George Savile, the player we've been mentioned, only 210. Murray Wallace, 200. 200. Zion Fleming is 436. Uh, which seems to be the leader at the moment. Um, so yeah there you go but there are some bargains to be had and if we go down and scroll down and see for the t-shirts 
even better there's a lot more bargains to be had here um now if, if you don't remember you don't know the players wore these t-shirts when they were warming up um and what they are is they have the name of a player who was killed in the first world war who lived uh, around the den at some some kind of street you can see one here jay goodman that's Ildesden Road. He's with Royal Field Artillery. He's age 31. And that was George Animan's shirt. So um, some of these are, I don't know if the families of the people involved are, are trying to bid for them or what. You've got 182 for Remain Essays. Jay Davies from the Old Kent Road. I don't know if the people are actually related or if it's just your name. These names are quite, um, quite common names, like Smith, Ward. So maybe if you. If they've got the same name as you having this kind of shirt with your your surname here um, might be something to, uh, to to take care of but like I said even there look Murray Wallace 100 quid Jeremy and Mac 106 and they've all signed it they've all signed it you can see here they've got signature on the at the top on the shoulder signature um, of the players involved so there's some bargains to be had and all, all the money the profits uh, go to uh, the poppy day appeal and once this is done i'm sure we've got a total amount of how much money they've raised uh now moving on to this uh the fa youth cup draw has been made third round uh unlike last year we got the toughest of tough draws where you got arsenal away um actually got barking at home so not a bad draw. So Mill under 18s host Barking in the FA Youth Cup third round. Um, Mill under 18s have been drawn at home to Barking in the FA Youth Cup third round. The Lions were paired with their six senior league outfit in Friday's draw, of the fixture, fixture set to be played before Saturday the 16th of December. So basically, in the next month, they have to play this game. It needs to be played at, at the Den, um, generally in the evening. Um, so there you go. Uh, part of the rules, it needs to be, it, it's an evening kickoff and it uh, has to be played at the den. Uh, some of the big, you can nominate a substitute ground, but only up until the quarterfinals. That has to be done um, in your application at the start of the season. You can't change it halfway through. I guess unless there's extreme um, exterminating cyber circumstances. So this game will be played at the Den. Um, like I said, nice easy draw. Um, barking. Um, I'm sure many of the players at Barking will probably be of the West Ham persuasion. So it's kind of like a Millwall versus West Ham sort of. Um, should be a nice, uh, nice little game. So always always a good game to go to uh, uh cup games because there needs to be a winner uh, i don't think they do replays i'm not sure i can find out i don't think they do replays um obviously because uh, the premier league don't want them and they pay money now so you've got to do what they say so yeah good 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 stuff there and now moving on to this from mealfc.co.uk uh, I was speaking to you the other day about stadium tours and how would make a good present, Christmas present, um, especially for a child. Very cheap, those ones. Well, here we go. How about this? Um, match A season to remember. Uh, Mill FC and then the season. There's four books out now. Um, a match-by-match -match account of Mill's football club's season. You've got the foot, uh, Division 4 promotion, Division 3 promotion, Division 3 promotion again in 75 76, and uh, Division 2 title winning season in 87 88. So, Mill supporters uh, Neil Fizzle and Merv Payne have released four new books covering seasons from the Lions past, taking in 64 65, 65 66, 1975 to 76. 87 to 88 campaigns the quartet display a match by match uh, review from each season and there's more in the pipeline if you're stuck for something to do over the international break why not pick up a copy of each one from amazon 
Or how about you go to uh, Victor Publishing's website and get it direct from them because I'm sure they'll get more money from that. Although, I think, I think, what this is is an affiliated link. I think if you click on that and go through and then buy it, Millwall will get some of that. Millwall will get a cut of that. I'll get um, a finder's fee. So I think that's what Millwall is saying by sending you to Amazon. But if you go to Victor Publishing, Victor V I C T O R, and if you do go there, check out the Who's Who Millwall book because I've got that, and that was also written by Neil Fizzler and published by Victor, and that's uh, that is pretty darn good. Um, it's basically got a little bit on each every single player to play for Millwall, and it's incredible. It's now you'd say in this day and age, well, we've got the internet. Why don't we just go on the internet? not the same it really isn't the fact that you can have a piece or a pro produced piece of paper in your hand but bind it together and just flick through it and have all of that knowledge instantly available for you to flick through and go through instantly you don't have to click on the next page or go back to the menu and go do all this shit it's real it's something that's real it's something that exists and it's something you can hold in your hand and something you can buy as a present and give it to someone and say, Daddy, happy birthday, Daddy. So, there you go. Um, why not? There you go. Um, now, if that doesn't tickle your fancy, apparently, so Blue Friday, we all done this before. Was it last year they did it? They, they must have did it. Um, so, obviously, Black Friday. Which is an American shit that has to do with Thanksgiving. So obviously after Thanksgiving, um, they have Thanksgiving is always on the last. Is it the last Thursday or the second Thursday? No, the last Thursday. Oh, I don't fucking know. Thursday in November, it's always in. Maybe the second or the third. Um, and then the day after, because that's a holiday. So the day after is like their Boxing Day where they have all the sales. Um, because people want to buy shit, um, and it's generally well, because you got you got Halloween, then you got Thanksgiving, and then you got Christmas. So, so well, if we have a sale or Thanksgiving, people can come in and buy stuff for Christmas, I guess. So, Mill were doing this Blue Friday thing, which is a parody of Black Friday, and so Mill Foot Club's Blue Friday is coming uh, with massive discounts on tickets and Mill TV Plus. Um, plus uh, 1885 Club, The Lion Store and more. Keep an eye on MillFC.co.uk as the deals begin to roll in. It all begins on Monday. So I don't know if they're going to do like a, a thing every day that you can buy on a discount. Sounds like it because if you see here, the sort of, what do they, they mentioned the tickets. So what are they going to do? Kids for a quid? They're going to do, if you're a season ticket holder or, or a member, you can bring one of your mates. I don't think we can do that anymore. We, we sell out all the games anyway, so um, I don't think we have space for that. Um, unless I don't know how they're going to do that. Maybe it's for next season season tickets. I don't know. Um, Mill TV Plus. So they mentioned tickets. Mill TV Plus. Eighteen eighty five Club Line Store. So that's at least four. So if they do one a day, um, we'll see. We'll see what they do. Um, Oh yeah, if you like, I say, if you're looking for a deal, you're looking for a steal. Come back on Millwall and see what they got for you. And on that note, I told you it was busy on it for Friday. Not bad. Friday during international break, quite a bit coming on. Um, and in that, on that note, thank you for watching and goodbye.